Welcome back to this series of lectures on uncertainty propagation. We're asking the question, how do the uncertainty in the inputs in our models, such as the parameters and, and the, the covariates and drivers themselves, translate into the uncertainty in our predictions? Essentially, how do we put confidence intervals and predictive intervals around models? Uh, in the last series of videos, we talked about analytical approaches to doing this, ones that involve solving uh, mathematical equations that are either exact or approximate solutions. Uh, here we're going to talk about numerical approaches to uh, uncertainty propagation. And uh, I'm going to make a, a, a not completely universal distinction between Monte Carlo approaches and ensemble approaches. And th with the idea being when I'm thinking about a Monte Carlo approach, I'm thinking about a numerical methods that uh, draws enough samples from a distribution as to approximate that distribution with those samples and with an ensemble we're often talking about taking enough samples that we can uh, estimate summary statistics such as means and variances, but not necessarily enough to get a full distribution. So what do we need, mean by ensembles? Uh, the basic idea of ensemble model uh, is, is to run your model uh, multiple times, uh, many times usually, and each time you run the model with slightly different inputs. And so if I'm interested in uh, propagating uncertainty about parameters, I'll sample from the distribution of parameters and run the model many times under different parameter values. If I'm interested in uh, propagating the uncertainty <clears throat> in say my X's, my drivers or covariates, then I could sample the uncertainties in, th in those X's and run the model and each time I'm running with different inputs. Um, and this, this approach uh, to ensemble prediction is a really common one. It's used frequently in numerical weather prediction and in many other situations you'll see it. Uh, you know, when you, you look at, you know, a hurricane forecast, you'll often see these ensemble predictions. So the key idea underlying uh, these numerical methods for uncertainty propagation is the same one we talked about when we introduced bootstraps which is the idea that we can approximate a distribution with samples from that distribution. So if we have enough samples, then the histogram itself is a good approximation of the distribution. And we can calculate any quantities we're interested in, uh, means, variances, quantiles, uh, from those samples directly. And so when we talked in the previous lectures about uh, transforming variances through models uh, that are nonlinear. We took linear approximations and we got an, uh, an exact solution to the approximate problem. Uh, here, we're going to instead thinking about transforming samples um, because we also saw that analytically transforming it through that distribution was, was hard. Uh, but one thing that actually turns out to be very easy is just taking samples from this distribution. And remember, we can't just take the, if this is a nonlinear function, we just can't take the mean and the variance or any other quantities and transform those directly because we're gonna violate Jensen's inequality. So given that all these other things are, are fraught with difficulty, this idea of taking samples and transforming samples is a remarkably simple one and a remarkably robust one because while you can't transform summary statistics uh, through distributions, you can transform numbers. So if I take a sample from my input and uh, plug, you know, run that through my model to predict an output, and I take another sample from my input and run it through my model to make predict an output, then I can approximate, uh, you know, the the samples from the output. And in fact, it is, you know, all of the uh, issues with nonlinearities and stuff like that are, are perfectly preserved with these um, numerical methods. And this, the key being you have to take enough samples. You have to have the ability to run your model enough times that you're uh, generating a distribution of predictions that is, is, uh, has enough samples in it to approximate the distribution itself. So if y is some function of x and theta is some sample, of our input space, then our probability distribution of y is just the histogram that we get when we take our function and plug in those samples. 
So written another way as a simple uh, algorithm, and I put a star here because this is sort of algorithm that's you know really important uh, to remember. Um, is we have uh, this idea of setting up a loop, and what we're going to do in that so inside that loop is we're going to start by drawing samples from our parameters or our input values or anything else we want to propagate uncertainty about. As long as we can take samples from it, we can propagate uncertainty from it. And we can propagate multiple sources of uncertainty at the same time. Again, as long as we can take samples from our uncertainties, we can then propagate them. We can take samples from them and then we run our model. And when we run our model, we then save the results and uh, we can then summarize those results in terms of distributions of predictions. So another way of thinking about that, kind of a, a you know, uh, when we're talking about bootstraps, I kind of draw out a, a basic figure of thinking about what the inputs, action, and outputs are. You know, the inputs of this algorithm are samples of uh, your inputs. Uh, the action inside is that we are running the model and making predictions. And so the outputs from this algorithm are samples of predictions. And that's in contrast to the bootstrap where what went in was samples of our data. The action that was performed was fitting the model and what came out was samples of parameters. Um, and actually not only are these different, it's really important to know uh, the, the basic similarities of these algorithms, but also the basic differences. So again, the bootstrap, your sample in the bootstrap, you're sampling your data, fitting the model, getting out samples of parameters. In the Monte Carlo, you're starting with samples of parameters, you're running the model to make predictions, and you're saving samples of predictions. And this has to do a lot with again the intent. It was a slide I started with at the beginning showing. You know, the, the goal of the bootstrap is to understand the uncertainty in the parameters, which we use for hypothesis testing. The goal here is to understand the uncertainties in the model, which we use for predicting, um, putting comps and predictive intervals around our model. And furthermore, we can see that these two algorithms line up very nicely. The input here, samples of parameters, is exactly what the output of the bootstrap is giving us, samples of parameters. So we can think of these as, you know, if these are two black boxes, you know, the first black box directly feeds the second black box. Uh, so what do we mean by samples of predictions? You know, we literally can envision that if I sampled, for example, with a regression model, if I can sample an intercept and sample a slope, I can then draw a line. And if I can sample it again and again, so I've now sampled three intercepts and three slopes and draw drew three lines and I keep doing this up, keep doing this. I keep four samples, five samples, six samples, seven samples. Each time I draw a line, so I'm saving a sample of predictions. And then I can do this not tens of times, but hundreds of times and thousands of times and tens of thousands of times. And you can see that if I do this enough uh, that I have uh, generated uh, a sample, a large sample of predictions. And indeed, if I choose any specific location along the x-axis, I have a whole slice through probability distributions. I have enough samples that I essentially have at, for every point along the x-axis, I have a, a probability distribution of predictions uh, created through this Monte Carlo approach. Um, and it has this classic hourglass shape that our linear regression is expected to have. Uh, and whatever model we're working with, with however nonlinear it is, is we're going to have uh, a shape of that distribution uh, the, the, of those uh, at each point. So we have an interval estimate, and we can literally, you know, march around along the x-axis and calculate the quantiles of that distribution in order to put a confidence interval on this. So uh, the basic advantages of this Monte Carlo algorithm: uh, it's simple. And it's is very conceptually simple. If I can sample through something and run my model, I can make a prediction and save those predictions. It's very general. I can apply this in pretty much any case. And it gives me this full probability distribution. 
And as noted earlier, it can be applied to many types of uncertainty, many types of uncertainty simultaneously. So if I have to deal with uncertainties in my inputs and uncertainties in my parameters, if I can sample through them both at the same time, I can propagate them both at the same time and get the overall uh, estimate of their, their total uncertainty. Uh, the disadvantages of this approach uh, is purely one of computation. That's uh, the, the biggest disadvantage is that it only works if you can actually afford to run your model uh, thousands of times. And it also only really works if you have a way of sampling from your inputs. Uh, the other disadvantage is we don't have a nice analytical solution. So we don't have the general generality of understanding that sometimes comes uh, with an analytical solution. Cool. So with that in mind, I want to quick walk through how we would actually implement uh, this sort of algorithm in code using R as an example. So when we talked about bootstrapping, we went through the example of a simple quadratic model. Uh, we went through the first step of writing down the likelihood. So here's our log likelihood function, an initial guess at the parameters, uh, using an optimization algorithm to find our maximum likelihood fit and saving that. Here I'm now saving the parameters that came out from that. So this first chunk of code is just our maximum likelihood. The second chunk of code is our bootstrap. We start with some number of samples we want to take. We set up some storage. We set up a loop. In this case, I'm using a parametric bootstrap where I've assumed the model stru is structurally correct, but there's uncertainty in the parameters. So I'm generating pseudo data from uh, the, pro the same model that we're using, same data model as our, as our likelihood our same equation as our likelihood, and then we're just plugging in the maximum likelihood estimates, making predictions, uh, and then getting out a sample, you know, refitting the model to that sample data and getting out a sample of predictions. So again, sample of parameters in, the action is fitting the model, sample of parameters out, data in, parameters out. Uh, so now, again, maximum likelihood, bootstrap. And then that gave us these distributions of parameters. So that now sets us up well for the Monte Carlo, where we start by setting up some storage. Um, and so here I'm setting up two matrices, one to store the predictions that I'm going to use for my confidence interval, the other that's storing the predictions that I'm going to use for my predictive interval. Um, setting up that matrix where I have some number of bootstrap samples, uh, some number of samples I'm going to do some for the Monte Carlo as my rows. And so each row is a different sample of model predictions. And each column is a, is a specific point on the x-axis. So um, here I'm, I have some sequence of x's that I make predictions for. And I'm, my uh, number of columns is the length of those predictions. Cool. So now I'm going to set up a for loop. I'm going to loop over uh, the number of samples I want to take. And the first thing I'm going to do is just calculate the mean prediction from the model given those sample parameters. So here I have my uh, a sample for my intercept, a sample for my slope, a sample for my quadratic parameter. And I'm making a prediction at every point along this x sequence. And so this expected value of y is drawing the curve. It's a quadratic curve, so I'm drawing this curve. Um, and then I'm, I'm saving that curve as uh, into this y conf because that's making a, the prediction uh, about the mean. Because again, the, the model, the uncertainty in the parameters relates to uncertainty about uh, our, our confidence in the mean of the prediction. And then for my y pred, I'm generating pseudo data around that prediction. So I have that mean, I have my uh, standard deviation, and I take uh, a number of samples along that length. So for every value of the mean, I generate pseudodata. And this generation of pseudodata is, is essentially identical to what we did on the previous slide with the parametric bootstrap, uh, with the important differences in the parametric bootstrap, we were always using the, the maximum likelihood estimate of the parameters. So we weren't accounting for parameter uncertainty, we we're just accounting for residual uncertainty. And here, this EY, expected value of Y, accounts for the parameter uncertainty. And then we're also adding in 
uh, through generating pseudodata, the uncertainty in the likely observations. So now we get out this whole matrix or two matrices, one about the mean, one about the predictions, and then we can just apply whatever functions we need uh, to that by row to get, uh, again, we have a, for every point along that sequence of X values, we have a histogram of predictions. And so if I apply by column, you know, by location, the quantile function, I can calculate here, uh, the 0 0.025, 0 0.975, so a 95% comps interval. Um, I also put in the 0 0.5 to get the median prediction. And I, for the uh, predictive interval, I've calculated, again, the 95% comps interval. I could have also applied uh, the mean function to get the mean. I could have applied the SD function to get the standard deviation, the VAR function to get the variance, whatever I want to know about that distribution. And also a quick reminder is that even if we used a pseudodata bootstrap, uh, which generated uh, a bunch of pseudodata. Uh, we still need to generate new pseudodata here uh, because we, have, we didn't account for the parameter uncertainty when we were doing the bootstrap because we didn't know it yet. We, that kind of generated is what gave us the estimate of the parameter uncertainty. And so now here we can see, uh, you know, kind of connecting the dots across those uh, estimates of the quantile. So, you know, the green line here is the comps interval. The blue line is the predictive interval uh, drawn for those samples. You can see the comps interval, uh, which has one less source of uncertainty is much smoother. It's uncertainty about the mean. Uh, there is a bit of jaggedness in this particular case and then uncertainty about the predictive interval. Uh, and uh, we can make that arbitrarily smooth and precise by just taking more and more samples. The fewer samples we take, the more uh, noise there will be in these interval estimates. And uh, yeah, I think that's what I wanted to focus on. Cool. So next I want to kind of make the, an important distinction here. And it's, it's uh, again, somewhat arbitrary, I said it earlier is that when we're working with a Monte Carlo approach, we're envisioning a case where we can take enough samples from our ensemble, uh, when our ensemble size is large enough that we are generating essentially uh, estimates of the full probability distribution at any point in time. So here is a you know, numeric weather forecast, you know, generating uh, samples. Uh, in this case, it's only generating, you know, I don't know, I didn't do the count here, 15, 20, some odd, a dozen predictions, uh, but not a huge number. And we can see as we can move farther out, um, you know, it's probably, it gives us an estimate of the spread and the mean, but it's not actually giving us enough to really draw a full histogram. So in this case, our ensemble size is smaller. And if we want to uh, estimate uh, a confidence interval or something like that, we can't really rely just on the samples because there's not enough on them. We have to make some sort of distributional assumption. And so we then come into this idea of instead of getting the full distribution, we're just relying on moments, means, variances, things like that. And so the basic trade-off between the two, uh, the Monte Carlo approach gives you the full distribution but takes more samples. The ensemble approach gives you means and variances instead of the full distribution, takes less samples. Uh, and basically inter interval estimate comes at the cost of making an assumption about a distribution while the Monte Carlo approach you know, generates the full distribution. Okay. I uh, wanted to skip past the, those. So here is showing, uh, a, a nonlinear example. It's actually one that we'll we'll revisit in lab, uh, which is uh, the ACI curve. So in the previous lab, we uh, generated a bootstrap estimate of the parameter uncertainties uh, from the ACI curve, having done the maximum likelihood fit in the lab before that. Uh, so in in here, what we're going to be doing is we're just showing a sample of predictions from those parameters. We've taken the parameters that came out of our bootstrap and made a sample of predictions. So this would be you know, an ensemble sized estimate of 
predictions if we ran it you know uh, a handful of times you know ten you know tens of times not thousands of times um, but it gives you an idea of what it's doing and kind of how it's capturing the shape of this distribution uh, of this interval estimate if I can on the other hand run this uh, thousands of times in this case I think I ran this 5,000 times uh, using 5,000 samples from the bootstrap parameters and drawing uh, the lines, so the red lines are the comps interval, and then adding uh, residual error on top of that. So they get the green lines, which are our predictive intervals. Uh, yeah, so this is an estimate, uh, a Monte Carlo estimate of the uh, uncertainty intervals, the comps and predictive intervals around a nonlinear function, one that we've seen in lab before. And not only can we do uh, these, I just also wanted to reinforce at any particular point and on the uh, x-axis that we are actually getting a distribution. So we here is an example of the distribution of uh, predictions, uh, in this case at 399 points parts per million. And we can see uh, the, the predictions for the mean in this black distribution, which is the one that we use to generate the comps interval. And that's a much, much tighter uh, distribution. And then we have our, in red, uh, the samples we use of uh, distribution of predictions, which is a broader distribution because now we've added uh, the residual error on top of it. And the difference between those is, again, that contribution of the residual error. In the latter ca case, uh, those distributions were, you know, uh, roughly normal. You know, we could maybe go back and see uh, a little bit of skew in the mean prediction. Its tail is a little bit uh, longer in the upper direction, but not huge. Uh, here's an example of a very non-Gaussian distribution that might come out of a uh, Out, out of one of these Monte Carlo algorithms. In this case, we have a whole peak of values near zero. We have a, a trough and a second peak. Uh, and this also kind of reinforces uh, something that I think is important. Again, Jensen's inequality. So this happens to be uh, the mean of this distribution. While this value right here is actually uh, what you would have gotten out of the function if you had plugged in the mean parameters for this particular model. In this case, it's a, a atmospheric transport model uh, looking at air pollutants, which we'll cover later in the class. And we can also calculate any quantiles of, of interest. So you can, you can calculate 95% you know, comps intervals, but you can also, you might have other quantiles that are interest. So in this case, since it's, we're looking at an atmospheric pollution pollutant, there's actually a, a, a legal regulatory threshold that we're interested in. We can actually calculate you know, what's the probability of exceeding that threshold? And in fact, one of the things that's important to know about uh, these interval estimates that come from Monte Carlo approaches is the smaller, the farther we get out in the tails of any distribution, the more and more samples we need to approximate those well. So we can approximate the mean and standard deviation with a relatively small number of samples, uh, interquartile range with more, but not ton. But in, as we move out to you know 80%, 90%, as we move out now in larger interval estimates, we need more and more samples. That was something I said in the with bootstrapping as well. Uh, so if I needed to know a you know a one in ten thousand chance, I would probably need you know millions of samples to get a solid estimate of that. Uh, coming back to ah yeah, actually changing topics. Uh, and actually, but coming back to something we talked about in an earlier video uh, in this series on sensitivity analysis, I wanted to point out this uh, again is the uh, that ACI curve example that we're, we cover in the last two labs of uh, looking at a couple different parameters. And now we actually can show we can do one of these Monte Carlo sensitivity analyses using the output from uh, from a Monte Carlo analysis. So we here are samples of parameters and here are samples of predictions at a particular place and uh, particular value of X. 
Uh, so this is the same value that was here as 399 parts per million. So at that particular value of X, we can say you know, there was a whole sample of parameters and then there's a whole sample of predictions coming out of that. And we can contrast uh, an example where uh, the slope uh, is positive and, and no notable sensitivity. Uh, in this case, it's you know about it's explaining about sixty five percent of the variability in the predictions is attributable to VC max uh, versus a case where here uh, little r uh, the dark respiration rate uh, makes very little contribution uh, negative slope and very little contribution to the overall uncertainty and the uh, again showing. Uh, attributing that uncertainty using a simple regression model, and then also, you know, fitting a more nonlinear curve fitting. In this case, it was a lowest curve, but you could do the same thing with a spline or any other sort of smooth curve uh, through these Monte Carlo samples as well. So the Monte Carlo sensitivity analysis has some nice advantages in that it is also simple in general and deals with multiple uncertainties. It is global in extent in that it is sampling uh, many uh, sources of uncertainty over their full domain. Uh, it's you know, all the same advantages of the uncertainty analysis and same disadvantages. And in fact, you know, like I, I said earlier when I talked about sensitivity analysis, you essentially get this analysis for free. Uh, well, you get the hard part of it for free in the sense that the hard part is running the model and generating those Monte Carlo samples. And the, the remaining thing to do to estimate sensitivity is really just fitting these regression lines uh, through the predictions to ask, you know, for each of the parameters that went into the prediction, how much of the variability can we attribute to each of them? So that kind of wraps up uh, the discussions on uncertainty propagation. And in the next video, we'll move on to talking about uncertainty analysis.